Here's a fun hypothetical scenario. Let's say you wake up in an empty room and a voice comes on that says, Hi there. You on the table? I wonder if you'd mind taking a brief survey. It's just a handful of simple personal questions. Sounds easy enough, right? Great, off we go. But the thing is, no matter how hard you try, you can't seem to answer any of them. I don't... You can still name places. Please name any US state or territory. I don't know, Delaware. But you can't remember the one where you grew up, or the one where you are living now. Wait. Which state or territory, please? I, I, I don't know. You still have access to reason, you can still think logically. What is Mr. Egan's favorite breakfast? I don't, that one makes no sense. Right. So it's clear that your brain doesn't seem to be totally broken. And yet, you don't remember what your parents look like. You don't remember anything about yourself, really. Not even your own name. And so now, for the big question. Who are you? Who are you? This is the beginning of the show Severance which follows a team of office workers whose memories have been surgically divided into their work and personal lives. In other words, when they are at work, they don't remember anything about who they are on the outside. And when they are not at work, they don't remember anything about what it is they did there. If you haven't seen the show, don't worry, I won't spoil anything important, because even without going into the actual plot of the show, this initial premise already brings up some fascinating questions. For one, while the idea of separating your work brain might seem kind of appealing at first. After all, if you don't remember going to work, it will feel like you never went. In your conscious experience, you head in at 9am and suddenly it's 5pm and you're already done. There are some ethical issues that arise the moment you realize what this means for the conscious experience of your work self or as the show refers to it, your innie, the you who's at work, the version that is severed from the Audi. I'm sorry, Audis are... They're us, on the outside. Because when you leave the office, this doesn't mean that your innie goes into rest mode, or goes unconscious until the next morning. Well, for you it does. Or rather, in your conscious experience, it feels like this is the case. But in the conscious experience of your innie, however, the moment they exit their office, they enter right back into it. So it's tomorrow now? Uh, yeah. Well, it's Monday. A weekend just happened. Yeah. I don't even feel like I left. As such, they don't get to go to sleep, they don't get to go out or practice any hobbies. They have no existence whatsoever outside of work. So in effect, that version of you is trapped there. Well, uh, I mean, not trapped, uh, yeah. but... But what? Again, as you can see, the show's basic premise raises a variety of philosophical and ethical issues, and offers lots of food for thought when it comes to our relation to work and other more socio-political and cultural matters. But for the purpose of this video, what I am interested in is the identity of the innies and the question of who we would be without our memories. Because is our memory not one of, if not the most important element that shapes our sense of self? Do we not by and large define ourselves by our experiences, by the story of where we came from, where we've been, and all the things and people we encountered along the way? Are all of our beliefs, our fears and desires, our hopes and dreams not constituted by the accumulated impact of what we remember? And yet, when we are presented with the innies, with individuals who are stripped from their memories, it is clear that there is still something left. That these characters still have distinct personalities. That they are still somebody. So today let's take a look at what exactly is happening here. How does our memory really work? How does it relate to our sense of self? And who would we be without it? Is there an identity without memory? This video was brought to you by Mubi. First off, when we talk about memories, we often refer to a specific subdivision of our long-term memory, which is known as our episodic memory. 
As the name suggests, our episodic memory records the various episodes of our lives, all the events that we experienced. It is the part of our memory where we store our autobiography that grounds us in our own history. And therefore, it is the part that we generally perceive as the most important part for our sense of self, and that the innies in severance no longer have access to. Or at least, they no longer have access to the episodic memory of their Audi. They can, however, still make their own episodic memories. This, of course, has its own set of consequences, as it implies that the identity of the innies grows more distinct over time. Well, since this perceptual version of you only exists at Lumen, I mean, quitting would effectively end your life, I mean, in so much as you've come to know it. In other words, as their episodic memory grows, they also develop a stronger sense of self, which, in the context of the show, raises ethical questions about the validity of their existence. I am a person. You are not. And it brings up some psychological speculation about the extent to which their episodic memory feeds into their larger sense of self, which in turn would also affect their Audi. But let's not get ahead of ourselves yet. Jesus. No. Most directly related to our episodic memory is our semantic memory. This is where we store our factual and conceptual knowledge, and the language with which to communicate it. If episodic memory is our autobiography, semantic memory can be seen as our textbook or dictionary. It's the type of knowledge that exists independently of our specific experiences, and which our innies still seem to have access to. What even are these numbers? Like, do we even know what we're supposedly cleaning? My theory? The sea. For example, Dylan's innie here has never actually seen the ocean, but he still knows what an ocean is conceptually. It is also why Heli, our character from the opening scene, could still name a US state without remembering any actual experiences within one. I don't know, Delaware. Without semantic memory, the innies would be absolutely naive about the world, themselves, and existence in general and would not have the language to be able to communicate anything about it. They would not be able to read. They would probably not have been able to communicate anything at all. As such, it is understandable that their employers left this part largely intact. So that's unknown, unknown, Delaware, unknown, unknown. <laughs> that's a perfect score. I say largely because, in reality, the distinction between episodic and semantic memory is not set in stone, and they often work in cooperation with each other. For example, you can momentarily forget what day it is, a piece of semantic knowledge. But if you have, let's say, a family dinner every Friday night, and you find yourself at that dinner, you might fill in the gap with your episodic memory that records such routines and events. Inversely, we also remember things about ourselves without having the corresponding episodic memory. We all know our date of birth, for example, but we don't remember the experience of being born, and so we remember it semantically, not episodically. In this sense, when the innies lose their memories, they lose their episodic memory as well as some semantic memories, as, besides not remembering any experiences they've had, they also cannot remember certain facts about their personal lives on the outside. I guess I went home last night, but I don't know if home is a house or an apartment or if I live with a family. I like to think my Audi lives on like a riverboat. Both of these subdivisions, however, are part of the same larger category known as our explicit or declarative memory, which is the type of memory that requires conscious thought and awareness, and that, as we've seen, is associative. We can consciously connect the memories of one subdivision to that of the other. But there's a second larger category as well, which is known as our implicit or non-declarative memory. The most important type of implicit memory is procedural memory. This is the place that records all of our skills, all of our learned procedures that we do not have to consciously think about when we practice them. It's our how-to knowledge all the things that we can just do without consciously thinking about them. Our innies clearly still have this type of memory as, among other things, they still know how to walk, which is a skill that, once you've learned it, you no longer actively think about when you're doing it. In fact, you probably couldn't even articulate how exactly you do it. 
because it just comes so intuitively. And yet, technically, you are still drawing on memory. You're still relying on information that is stored somewhere in your brain. But again, it's implicit. Ow! What I personally find fascinating about implicit memory is that it's largely shaped by your explicit memory through a concept known as priming. Priming essentially turns explicit memories into implicit ones through frequent or impactful exposure. We see this with more procedural actions. Making your first cup of coffee, for example, requires your explicit memory, as you are probably drawing on the memory of someone who explained to you how it's done, or the memory of you observing someone else making coffee. But by the time you've made your 10th, or definitely by the time you've made your 100th cup of coffee, you're no longer using your explicit memories to figure out how to do it. It's become implicit knowledge. But we also see the effects of priming in the way we direct our episodic and semantic memory. Going back once more to the initial interview question. Please name any US state or territory. Even without your episodic memory, the answer that is given here might still be influenced by it. If you, for example, grew up in, let's say... I don't know, Delaware. You might prime yourself to intuitively reach for that place first when someone asks you to name a US state or territory, even when your episodic memories about it are gone. All I can be is sorry and that is all I am. I'm afraid you don't mean it. Again, please. In the show, the employers even seem to rely on the innie's capacity for priming as they have this punishment system, simply called the break room in which innies must read aloud a statement of regret, and then repeat it again, and again, and again. How many times? 1072. It is clearly excessive, and extends well beyond the point of sincere breakdown, which has me guessing that it's not really about getting an apology in that particular moment, but about priming the innies against future transgressions. I'm really I'm sorry, okay? <laughs> No paraphrasing. Again. This obviously is a relatively explicit example of priming, but as you can probably guess, it has deeper and more subtle consequences as well. Because what it does is, it basically takes the conscious aspects of ourselves. You know, the experiences that we've had, the ideas and beliefs that we've been exposed to, the skills that we have learned, the emotions that we have felt, the suffering that we've had to endure all the things that we can or that we at some point were able to remember, and transforms them into the unconscious building blocks of our personality and identity, into the implicit memories that prime us towards the future, and that, in part, define who we are beyond our conscious awareness. You carry the hurt with you. You feel it down there too. You just don't know what it is. And so, as for our initial question, who are we without our explicit memories, it seems safe to say that we are still somebody, that we still have personalities and that we would still act, or at least react, in ways that are largely distinctive to us. That we cannot filter out one small and singular aspect of ourselves that fully encapsulates who we are. But what all this really reveals, at least to me, is just the sheer complexity of the nature of our identity, and what this says about how we relate ourselves to it. Because the connections between the different forms of memory, and the countless ways in which they interact, in which they inform, trigger, and enhance each other, go far beyond what we've discussed here so far. And we still don't know for sure how exactly it all functions. You think when you reach a certain age, things will start making sense? And you find out you're just as lost as you were before. Just look at the way our senses play into all this as well. How they can unlock memories long forgotten. And transport us back into our own history. Or the way we can prime ourselves towards reflexive actions that become almost involuntary. Both physically as well as mentally. I can tell you the license plate numbers of all six cars outside. Now why would I know that? How can I know that and not know who I am? This becomes especially clear with trauma responses, with the way past experiences of sorrow and hurt come to seemingly inhabit the body, 
and rise up when it feels threatened again, even when the initial transgression has long been repressed from conscious memory. Are you, are you sure? For that's the thing too, we manipulate ourselves both consciously as well as unconsciously. We misremember, ignore, distort and fragment. What does this say about the things we explicitly remember, and perhaps even more unsettling, about the things we implicitly remember? Can we prime ourselves based on false memories, shape ourselves around delusions? Do I lie to myself to be happy? It brings up some fundamental questions about who we are. What really defines us? How much grip do we really have on ourselves? Can we choose what to hold on to? What to let go? To what extent can we really direct the course of our own identity? And all this is without even having gone into the sort of hard-coded elements of our character. Our sexual orientation, our general mental structure, you know, extroversion, introversion, neural divergence, but also other personality traits, perhaps. Are we hard-coded with a predetermined degree of gentleness, aggressiveness, impulsiveness? With a pre-established sense of humor, intelligence, a disposition towards specific talents? The exact divide between nature and nurture also doesn't seem to have been settled yet. And one can even question to what extent it really matters over time. For as our implicit memory develops, as we are primed towards certain actions and reaction, whether through our own conscious effort and choice or through external circumstances, can we not also alter some aspects of our nature? Certainly not all, as we've seen with sexual orientation for example, the denial of which only seems to lead to a lifetime of self-doubt and internal conflict. And I wonder to what extent this applies to other aspects of our character as well. When we are trying to change something about ourselves, how do we know if we are not just trying to combat our own nature? That we've started a battle that was lost from the start, and that, in that effort, we only create a divorce between the different parts of our inner being. It's tragic, really, and to me quite frightening. The thought that we can prime ourselves against ourselves, that we can come to implicitly embrace that which is ultimately destructive to us, and that we can end up feeling like we no longer have a true self, just fragmented pieces. I suppose that's what damnation is. The pieces of your life never to come together. And it can happen the other way around too. For me, the most potent warning against the danger of drug abuse is that it can permanently change your brain chemistry, thereby essentially changing your nature and messing you up even if you want to make a change for the better, even if you want to make a conscious effort to prime yourself in a different direction. I want to stop, but please, 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 no rehab, all right? Just let me come home. I wish that I could help you, but I can't do that. I, I can't. Is there a point where we can irreparably damage our relation to ourselves? Would we even be able to know when it happens? Just speaking for myself, I doubt it. I think I'd always want to cling to some notion of self. To the idea that there is a conscious presence within me capable of relating itself to itself. Capable of operating with some degree of internal freedom, with some degree of purposeful action. Even if that presence exists within a larger inner world that is as conflicted, chaotic and mysterious as the universe itself. Because again, despite our general obsession with ourselves, who we are, how we function, and so on, we still seem to know so little. And I guess there's hope in that too, even if it requires a bit more of a leap of faith. If anything, there is some peace of mind, at least for me, in just being aware of all these different internal forces and complexities that our identity cannot be reduced to a relatively singular set of episodic memories, that it cannot be articulated in some absolute definitive way. It makes me look at myself and others with more reverence, with more patience and humility, 
It makes me feel more at ease with the idea of people not being consistent all the time. That it is okay that we don't have a completely coherent and sensible identity. That the struggle for a sense of self is never truly settled. And that we are all still trying to figure it out. You know, you will think of things and I'll get bored with you and feel trapped because that's what happens with me. Okay. You wake up without knowing where you are. One fascinating film that beautifully equates the mystery of the universe with that of the human soul and that explores both as if it were this giant inner landscape is Terence Malick's Voyage of Time. The film basically depicts a consciousness drifting through time and space, trying to make sense of itself by piecing together the fragmented images of its own experience and of its knowledge about existence as a whole. As a documentary it is completely unconventional, but also provocative, beautiful and at times truly profound. And a unique version of this film, one that is narrated by Brad Pitt, is exclusively available on MUBI, who kindly agreed to sponsor this video. MUBI is a curated streaming service showing hand-picked exceptional films from around the globe. Every day they present a new film, whether it's a timeless classic, a cult favorite or an acclaimed masterpiece, there is no better way to explore the riches of cinema. They feature hundreds of carefully selected films, and if you go to mubi.com slash likestoriesofold, you can try Mubi for free for 30 days. So be sure to claim your extended free trial and begin your month of great cinema today.